Thank you so much. It's great to be here with friends, and I'm so thankful for your leadership and uh, for your kindness and friendship through these years, and uh, you really are a great encouragement to me, and I know to these men as well. It's so good uh, to be with you. I tried to get around and meet as many of you personally as I could before chapel started, and those I didn't get a chance to say hello to and shake your hand, I'd love to be able to when we're finished. I'll be around campus today, and if there's any way that I can serve you or encourage you, pray for you, pray with you about a need, I would love to do that. Had the honor of being able to be at the university yesterday and again tomorrow, and count it a true high privilege to be able to spend these moments in the Word with you. As he mentioned, I'm from uh, Mustang, Oklahoma, which is right in the middle of the state, right next to Oklahoma City. And if you wonder what life is like in Oklahoma, uh, I left Sunday and it was about 65 degrees and today is about the same. Tomorrow, they're preparing for an ice storm, Thursday, preparing for about four to six inches of snow. And oh, by the way, yesterday had an earthquake. And so just a little snapshot in the life of Oklahoma, I find it ironic. I left Oklahoma, came to California, and missed the earthquake. But such is life. It is an honor to be able to open God's Word with you today. And I have really just two things I want to accomplish. First, I want to glorify the Lord in our time together. And second, I want to try to strengthen your faith and encourage your hearts wherever you may be this morning. So I'd like to open with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Lord, we are thankful to be here. We are grateful for this seminary, and we're grateful for these men. Lord, I I very well understand that these gentlemen are exposed to the finest preaching and the greatest minds on a daily basis and week by week here at this seminary and at this church. I understand that they are blessed to be able to have an education as fine as anywhere around the world. I also know that in the midst of that reality, that the greatest hope that we have is that we would love your son, Jesus Christ. That we do not want to fall to the side of being well-trained and equipped and yet failing to love Jesus. We do not want to be skilled in theology, yet weak in our passion to reach the lost. We want to blend all of these together. And so I pray that your spirit would strengthen me, would give me the right words to say, that what I say would be helpful and true I pray, Lord, against distractions in these men's minds, as I know they have a thousand different demands on their time, even this day. And I would pray that for a few moments we all could clear our minds of everything other than your word, and that we would receive from your hand today that which you have prepared for us. We ask your blessing in our time together, knowing that if your spirit does not help us There is nothing I could do on my own that would be of any value. And so we need your help. We need your grace. And we ask you to bless our time for the sake of your son. Amen. Let me invite you to open your Bibles in the Old Testament to Habakkuk. We were talking before chapel began. I know there are A few different ways to pronounce it. In Oklahoma, we just go with Habakkuk. If you go with a different route, forgive me. Uh, Here's the story. You you know it well. Let me just remind you of the context. I want to settle in at the end of chapter 3. Let's just begin with an honest confession that we all understand, and that is that life can be hard. I don't have to convince you of that. We know that from the earliest of our memories, and it can start as simple as when you are five years old and your parents tell you you have to share that new toy with a sibling that you don't want to share with, and life can be frustrating. Or it can advance and be a little bit more serious, maybe when you are 15 years old and 
you're the only one out of your group of friends that was not invited to the birthday party and you feel left out. And you find out that life can be disappointing. Or you advance and maybe you're 25 years old and you see all of your friends getting married and and you've longed for that and you've prayed for the Lord to bring the right spouse for you and for whatever reason, as you understand it at this time, That has not yet come, and you look around at your friends, and you wonder, why has the Lord blessed them in this way and not me? Or maybe as you labor away in seminary, your heart's desire is to to be able to find a place to serve God's people, and and the Lord has called you to preach and put a, a, a deep burden on your soul to do so, and for whatever reason, you're having a hard time finding that open door of pastoral ministry, and you begin to wonder, God, do you have something specifically for me? Or as you get older... It's not uncommon for people at 45 or 55 to look at their life and to wonder, is this, is this really what I'm supposed to do? Am I really giving my life to the right things? Or for some, maybe at 65 when they have lost their spouse and they never imagined being alone, and certainly not this early in life and for this long. Whatever the details are, we all understand that, that life can be hard. And sometimes life is hard because of mistakes we make and we kind of put ourselves into that path. And other times, life is hard because things just seem to find us. And when we find ourselves in the middle of a storm, and we understand that storms come in all different varieties and for all different durations, and some things that may seem silly to somebody else if it happens to you is quite painful. And when you enter that season of turbulence, for whatever it may be, it seems like there are really two questions that all of us find ourselves asking. Two questions, two words, why me and how long? Have you ever asked yourself or asked the Lord that question? God, why is this happening to me? And and God, how long must I go through this? then it seems that if we knew the answer to those two questions, at least in our mind, it feels like we can make sense of it. If we just knew, God, why am I going through this prolonged season of suffering? God, why is this prayer unanswered for so long? Maybe it's because God is punishing me, we think, or at another time we think maybe God is just preparing us for something, but All the while, if we just knew, God, why? What is the purpose? Or the second question, God, how long must this last? Whatever storm you're in, if you just know how long it's going to last. And yet we understand that we're not the first ones to ask that question. It's been asked many times before us and even asked in the Scripture itself including that's really the questions asked that Habakkuk offers to the Lord in this setting. Habakkuk, of course, is frustrated because in his mind, God isn't doing anything. And he says, God, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? And maybe better stated, God, why aren't you doing what I think you should do? And when you get to the end of the book of Habakkuk, of course, he's at a place of worship. And he's resting in God's sovereignty and resting in God's providence. But the question is, what is it that took Habakkuk from worry to worship? What is it that took him from feeling slighted by God to a place of complete surrender? Let me just remind you of of what I know you're familiar with in chapter 1, verse 2. Habakkuk says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or I cry to you violence and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? He is completely frustrated by what seems to him to be God's lack of activity. And of course, in verse 5, the Lord 
reminds him that that's not the case at all as he says, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. And then the Lord begins to tell him what he's going to do. He says, I've, I've not been deaf and I've not been blind and I've not turned my head. I, I'm aware of what's going on and I am going to bring punishment upon those who are evildoers. And he says the way he's going to do it is by bringing up and raising up the Babylonians to come destroy Judah and to take them into exile. And Habakkuk now says, God, you can't do that. And now the plan of God seems worse than what he thought was the inactivity of God. And Habakkuk protests in chapter 2, verse 1, says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And then the Lord says, let me tell you what you need to do. He says, write the vision, make it plain on the tablet so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. And if it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And I've just got to point out the irony of these words that the Lord says, it may feel slow, but it will not delay. Meaning, it may seem to you that things should happen more quickly, but it's going to happen exactly according to the purpose of God. And can I encourage you men with that truth in your life today? That it may seem to you that, that your seminary career is advancing slowly or your ministry career is getting a slow beginning or it may seem to you that the preaching opportunities you long for are slow to come and it may seem to you the influence you long to have, even with the best of motives, is slow in developing. But can I just remind you that in God's purposes and in God's plans, things will happen on his time, and that is all you really need to know. And of course, we see in verse 4, behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. And in chapter 2, the description of the coming judgment against the Chaldeans takes place, and when, by the time you get to chapter 3, this Incredible transformations happen in Habakkuk's life in verse 2 where he says, Lord, I have heard the report of you and of your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. And here's his prayer, in wrath, remember mercy. And then you get to the end of chapter 3, and this is where I want us to settle in for a few moments. Verse 16, Habakkuk says, I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones and my legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. And though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. I want to walk you through these final verses and I pray help you see how we as God's people have a song it's a song of the faithful. It's a song born out of trial and testing that develops and produces a faith that endures. Here's the first thing I want you to notice. There is a surrender that believers still give. There's a surrender that believers still give. We see that in verse 16 as he says, I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound and rottenness enters my bones and my legs tremble beneath me. Understand, gentlemen, that here Habakkuk trusts in the Lord, yet he's still overwhelmed. 
And he should be because what the Lord has revealed to him is a very difficult reality. What is about to come upon his people is something that is exceedingly painful. And yet Habakkuk says, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon a people who invade us. He's going to surrender himself to the purposes of God and the timing of God's plan. And so even though Habakkuk hurts, he waits. He's trusting. And he's grown from a place of anger and accusation to a place of reliance and rest. He now finds himself surrendering to the Lord, no longer arguing with him, no longer debating with him, no longer presuming he knows better than God knows, but he quietly surrenders himself to not only the purpose of God, but also the timing of God. I'll just confess to you, gentlemen, in my life, that second part can be very challenging. The purpose of God is one thing. The timing of God seems to be even harder sometimes. Is that true for you? We, we come to a place where we surrender ourselves to what God's will is. We just really wish that will would take place in a time schedule that fits our desires. My friends, that's not surrender. You understand that. The surrender the believer still gives is a complete surrender to both the will and the timing of God. Secondly, I want you to notice the struggle believers still face. The struggle believers still face. We see it in verse 17. Though he's made this honest confession in verse 16 of trust and wait upon the Lord, in verse 17 we see the struggle that we still face. Though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines. This is the potential of a loss of food. Though the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, this is the coming loss of an economy. And these are not hypothetical things for him. You know that. These are real things that are coming. This is the effect that's going to be left behind by the coming invasion. And the things that Habakkuk mentions here are the key elements in their agricultural economy. And what he says is, this is not simply some lofty theological, theoretical prayer. He is saying, this is the settled reality of my heart. When the day comes that the fig tree does not blossom, and when the day comes there is no fruit on the vines, and when the day comes that the olive fails and the fields yield no food, and when the flock are cut off from the fold and there's no herd in the stalls. What he's acknowledging here is that even though he is trusting and faithful, he understands there is a struggle believers still face. And gentlemen, don't don't pretend for a moment that you are the exception to that. Don't think that you can be so faithful that you can be exempt from suffering. Don't think that you can memorize enough vocabulary or or write a research paper strong enough or, or preach sermons that are powerful enough or counsel people wise enough that if you're just faithful enough, somehow you will be immune from the suffering that this world knows. Habakkuk's come to a place of surrender, and yet he acknowledges there's a struggle that believers still face. I want you to understand, and I want to be very honest with you, is with the truth that you well know that your faith does not guarantee any level of comfort in this world. Your fidelity to the gospel does not guarantee any measurable ministry success. That God is good and He gives good gifts to His children, absolutely. But do not think for a moment that you can be a successful enough seminarian that it's going to guarantee any kind of earthly comfort as you walk through this life and walk through your ministry. 
And if the day comes that you go to the grocery store and there is no food on the shelves, and if the day comes where you go to flip the switch and the power grid has been shut down and there are no lights that are turned on, or if you meet with that church over and over and over and they call you and tell you, I'm sorry, we're going another direction, or if you pray you pray diligently, and for whatever reason, for a time, that prayer feels to you to be unanswered. Don't think that what has happened to you is something strange. There are struggles that believers still face, even the faithful. And you men must set your heart and set your mind in such a way that you refuse to quit following the Lord or pursuing His will and call on your life just because things did not go the way that you thought that they would. We surrender, but do not think that that surrender erases your struggles. There are struggles believers still face. And we understand how we face them. It's, it's back in chapter 2, verse 4, that the righteous shall live by his faith. And, and I want to emphasize this to you, gentlemen. We, we read Habakkuk 2, 4, and we typically emphasize the word faith, and rightly so. The righteous lives by his faith. We understand that, as Hebrews teaches us, without faith, it's impossible to please God. The faith is paramount. But don't miss the word live, that we are to live by our faith. That we live daily, that we don't give up, that we don't retreat. And if the last two years have shown us anything, it's the propensity that people have to stay alive yet quit living. Our world is filled with the walking dead. They've stopped living. They've stopped trusting. They've stopped pursuing. They've stopped worshiping. They've stopped obeying. The righteous will live by their faith. No matter how your ministry is going and no matter what the measurables look like and no matter what the criticism may be that comes your way, and if you've not had the experience of spending hours and hours and hours in the study and laboring over the text and then preaching with all of your heart and with all of your passion and the very first email you open on Monday being a word of criticism, just hang there, it will come. And you're going to be tempted to say, is this worth it? I mean, do these people have any idea how much of my heart and soul I'm putting into feeding them? Do they have any idea how much I love them and how much I care for them? Do they have any idea how many hours I stay awake at night studying the text and praying for their souls and doing my very best to seek the Lord for them? And you know what the answer is. Of course they don't. But ultimately, it's not the pleasure of your people for which you serve, right? It's the pleasure of the king. But then what happens in our mind is we say, well, okay, I, I, can, I can understand that. I, I can live with that. But, but then, God, do you see how hard I'm working? God, do you know how much I'm trying to serve you? And the answer, of course, is what? Yes. Of course he sees. Of course he knows, which then we turn the question to, then God, if you see and if you know how hard I'm working and how much I'm trying to serve your people, then God, why are these struggles still coming my way? And that's where you've got to get to a place of surrender. The kind of surrender that says, I will be faithful to the Lord even though there are still struggles that I must face. See, if your obedience took away all the pain in your life, then your obedience would become an idol because it would lead you to that which you would tend to perhaps love more than Christ, namely everything in your life going the way you want it to be. 
That's not God's desire for your soul. And so Habakkuk reminds us that there's a surrender believers still give and a struggle believers still face. And yet, in spite of the struggle, thirdly, make note of this, there's a salvation believers still enjoy. Right in the midst of a verse 17 declaration is a verse 18 sense of worship. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. The word for rejoice here, it's not simply a statement of delight. This is a cry of triumph. Triumphantly, I rejoice in the Lord. Not because life is easy, not because things went the way that I wanted it to, not because the future is is simple, but because God is my God. Though there is the loss of the economy, and though there is the loss of all that I hold dear in an earthly sense, and though there is nothing on the vine, to put it in our context, nothing in the stores, Right in the midst of that reality, there is still a salvation that we enjoy, which is why the prophet says, yet, even in the midst of this, I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. These are mercies that extend beyond any material loss. And I want to say to you, gentlemen, You've got to fight for a joy in your life that can endure any material loss. You've got to fight for a joy in Christ that says, if all I have is the approval of Christ, I have all I need. Now let's let's not fail to be transparent in here. It's possible that you could be pleasing to the king and still have an elder board who doesn't believe in you. It's possible that the Lord is pleased with your preaching and you are still met with all kinds of opposition from people in the pew. And let's not pretend that that is insignificant. It's not. It's hard. It hurts. It's painful for you, and it's painful for your family. But there is a salvation that believers enjoy no matter what happens to them. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. The prophet here is learning that even if he is deprived of material comforts, he can still rejoice because of his faith in God. This is the heart of Paul in Philippians 4, verse 13, that everybody knows that every teenager thinks guarantees they'll hit more home runs, and everybody thinks, well, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, so I can always make first string, and I can always get the job that I want, I can always have the grades that I want. If you have ever prayed Philippians 4, 13 before a final exam you did not prepare for, my assumption is that did not go well for you. Why is that? Well, because Philippians 4.13 is a promise most often abused from its context. Its context fits beautifully with Habakkuk 3. Listen to Philippians 4, starting in verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Or to use Habakkuk's language, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Gentlemen, do you find joy in your relationship with God? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? You may look at me and be tempted to say, why would you even ask that? We're at the Master's Seminary. Of course we do. Don't don't be so fast to make that assumption. It is possible to love the pursuit of knowledge and not love the Savior. And if that is where you are heading, 
that kind of pursuit will not sustain you when there is no food on the shelves. Or to use his language, no cattle in the stalls. You must love Christ. Not because of what it can bring to you, not because of what doors it can open for you, not because of what kind of career it may pay for you, but because you love Christ. That is the salvation believers still enjoy, right? That is what Habakkuk shows us. If Habakkuk's plan is to use his salvation to a greater end, it's not going to take him anywhere because the end physically is the Babylonians are going to come in and they're going to bring all kinds of devastation to the people. No, the joy that he has is a joy that knows even if I lose everything I hold dear, I could never lose my relationship with the Lord. And that is the salvation believers still enjoy. And gentlemen, while you are memorizing vocabulary and you are reading textbooks and you are preparing for exams, you must see to it that your heart is growing in a love relationship with your Savior. Your diploma, your degree, your title will not see you through your darkest night. But your God will. Your God will. There's a salvation believers still enjoy. And I want you to see, fourthly, there's a strength believers still possess. This is such an interesting way that the wording fits here. There's a strength believers still possess. God, the Lord, is my strength. Yahweh is my strength. And the word for strength here is, is, is not only used of power, it, it can also at times be used to denote wealth. That, and this is an interesting thing, that even if we lose everything, yet I still have everything with the Lord. This is the promise believers can cling to, that only believers can cling to, that if the world takes everything from us, we are left with everything still. Because everything that matters to us is that given to us by God that the world cannot touch. For Habakkuk, this is not hypothetical. This is his life. And for some of you in this room, and maybe for all of us in this room, this may very well be our life. If the world robs from you everything they potentially can, there is a strength that you still have. There's a power you still have. In fact, the same language can can be used to describe an army. There's a strength. There's an army. There's a, a power that we still possess, which is a beautiful thought that Habakkuk is saying that even if the foreign invasion comes in and their military power overwhelms us, which it will, yet God himself will be the army for the faithful. Gentlemen, as you read the headlines, it won't take you long to get overwhelmed. And if your faith is weak, it will not take you long to become frightened. Here's what I want you to understand. That no matter what this world brings your way, there's a strength you still possess when you know God as your Savior. That's what sustains you. That's what compels you to continue to serve. This is what strengthens you to be able to do what He's called you to do, even if what He called you to do brings suffering. There's a strength that believers have because believers always have the Lord. And again, notice this is the fulfillment of chapter 2, verse 4, that the righteous shall live by his faith. How do we live? We live by knowing that God is our strength. God is your strength. God is what sustains you. 
God is who goes before you. God is who has saved you and who protects you, who keeps you, and one day who will welcome you home to your eternal reward. Everything about you that is worth conversation starts and ends with God. There's a strength that we still have. And notice what he says in verse 19. He makes my feet like the deer's. It's the picture of the light-hearted movement of the deer. It reflects the, the joy and the trust of the psalmist from Psalm 18. And he makes me tread on my high places. It's an interesting phrase. It, it actually comes from Deuteronomy 32. It's speaking in that context of the conquests of the land. And the idea would be that, that when you won the battle and you won the, the war, the land was yours, and so you could then go walk over the land because it was yours. And as you walked over the land, you were saying that, that this belongs to me. When, a uh, long time ago, we had, we had bought a house at a sheriff's auction uh, back in, in Mustang where we live now, and my kids were little at the time. And we had gone to the sheriff's auction, and, and the way that, that worked was we had to put a certain amount of money down, we then took possession or owned the house, but we didn't take possession until 20 days later when the occupant had to, to be gone. And so we had gone to the courthouse. We got the, the house and the sheriff's auction, and we were wanted to go look at the house. It was needed a lot of work, a lot of remodel work necessary. It was on about three acres, and so we took the kids over there. And my little boys were so excited. We had lived in this little bitty house, little bitty piece of land, where you could do a standing broad jump and go from you know driveway to driveway. And so they were so excited about this. And when they went around to the back of the house, and they were looking in the garage trying to see what it looked like on the inside, when all of a sudden, a car, a car drove into the driveway. The owners had not left the house yet. They were still there. And my little kids, who were second grade and fourth grade, took off running like you would not believe. Why? Well, because we didn't fully own the place yet. And so somebody else came and it, and it drove my kids away, afraid they were going to get in trouble for being there. That It wasn't fully yet our land. And fast forward three weeks, when we took final possession of the house and the land and the other people were gone, my kids went out and they walked the three acres nonstop. One of my kids said, can I dig a hole? And I said, for what? He said, to dig a hole. And I said, sure. And my eight-year-old took a shovel, went to the back corner, and he started digging a hole, which he dug repeatedly, which still part of it exists today because it was his land. He could walk the land. He could dig a hole if he wanted to dig a hole. It was his land. Habakkuk uses this terminology from Deuteronomy 32 to say that I'm walking the high places, meaning it's a place of conquest. One author points out that, that this is like a, a victory lap in the Olympics. When somebody wins a race in the Olympics, they, they take a victory lap around because in ancient battle, if you won the war, what you would do is go up to the high places, look down over the valley, and just survey the land that you have now acquired. Well, Habakkuk uses that language from Deuteronomy 32 to speak of his own heart. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. The conquest in Deuteronomy 32 was about the land. The conquest in Habakkuk 3 is Habakkuk's own heart. The battle's been won. He struggled. His faith was faltering in chapter 1. He questioned everything the Lord was doing. And now through surrender, his own heart has been settled. And like a deer lightly moving, or like a victor treading over the high places, looking at what has been won, Habakkuk says, my heart is settled on the Lord. And can I just point out to you, what is it that made the transformation in Habakkuk's life? 
But what took us from chapter 1 to chapter 3? It's really just two things. It's the Word of God, and it's His prayer. So when your people come to you and say, how is it that I can have victory? How can I win the battle? How can I get my own heart to believe? And they're looking at you, wanting you to say something brilliant, wanting you to say something they've never heard anybody else say. Gentlemen, you do not need to be profound. You need to be faithful. And what is it to be faithful? To know the word and to pray to our God. Don't ever outgrow your willingness to give your people the simple yet reliable truth that the victory is won when you labor in the word and you labor in prayer. That is where our strength comes from. As you go through seminary, there's always the temptation to want to come up with something no one else has ever said in a way that nobody else has ever said it. My friends, you can't improve upon this. Know the word, labor in prayer, for that is where the battle is won. And so, as you look at these final four verses in Habakkuk 3, we see there's a surrender believers still give and a struggle believers still face. A salvation believer still enjoy and a strength believer still possess. But there is one last thing I want you to see as we close. Number five, there's a song believers still sing. This is a fascinating part of Habakkuk 3 to me. This is a song. The end of it says, to the choir master with stringed instruments. Chapter 3 verse 1 begins with a musical notation. You see the phrase Selah all throughout. Why? Because this is a song. This is to be sung. This is to be set to music so the people of God have a way to express this. Why? Because Habakkuk knows he's not the last person who's going to struggle with these things. Habakkuk's not the last man who's going to say, God, why me? And God, how long? And what Habakkuk knows through the work of the Holy Spirit is that when God's people are struggling, God's people need a song to sing. Gentlemen, when the Lord opens for you to have influence over a congregation, one of the things you must do is protect the songs of the church. Habakkuk says, set this to music, play this with music because people need to sing this. And when you get to the end of Habakkuk chapter 3, what you see is a man who has come through so much, his faith has been transformed, and he's come from a place of doubt to worship and a place of struggle to surrender, and he ends it with, God, you are my strength. And then he says, let's write music so we can sing this wonderful truth. But you know what strikes me? If I were Habakkuk, by the time I get to the end of chapter 3, I might be tempted to say, can we go edit chapter 1 and 2? Because he doesn't look real good in chapter 1 and 2. He looks great at the end of chapter 3. He doesn't look real good in chapter 1. And if I'm Habakkuk, I might say, because I've come to the place of chapter 3, 6 to 19, let's set that to music. Let's maybe leave out the whole part of me saying, hey, God, you're not doing anything. But aren't you glad the Holy Spirit does not remove the flaws of the faithful? This is a real man in a real struggle with faith in a real God that saw him through. Gentlemen, understand, even through your flaws, the Lord is at work. And there's a song that we still sing. We wait and we trust. So, as you see the storm clouds on the horizon... As you see a society in increasing opposition to the things of God, 
as you see even judgment from God falling upon our land, and as the threats turn into reality, can I ask you to do what Habakkuk learned to do? Wait on God and trust in Him. Wait on God and trust in Him. So that when verse 17 is true for you, you can still declare verse 18 and verse 19. And in closing, what of that day? When your strength is failing, the end draws near and your time has come. What on that day? What about when you fought all you can fight and you get to the end and your body begins to give way? Yesterday was the day that Charles Spurgeon died 130 years ago. And of that day, he has written, the best moment of a Christian's life is his last one because it is the one that is nearest to heaven. You wait and you trust. Gentlemen, live by faith. Sing of your salvation and wait and trust in your God. Lord, we thank you for your word. And I do pray that you would use it to bring encouragement to these men's hearts. That whatever they're facing, that they would have a joy in you that sustains them through any test through any trial. And whether their struggle is, how am I ever going to graduate, or something even stronger like, will my little girl get healthy? Or anything in between. Lord, may they find in you their strength, their salvation, and their song forever declaring, you are enough. It's the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen.